A new theory of consciousness just dropped, and it's quite an ambitious one. Not only does it supposedly explain what consciousness is, it also gives you free will, and all of that thanks to quantum physics. It sounds like bullshit. But it comes from Hartmut Neven at Google Quantum AI and my favorite panpsychist Christoph Koch. Though saying that I have a favorite panpsychist is kind of like saying I have a favorite type of moldy brat. I had a look. Hartmut Neven is a German computer scientist and currently vice president of engineering at Google, so not exactly a crank. He's the Neven of Neven's law. That's the insight that exponential scaling of an exponential scaling makes a double exponential scaling. Amazing stuff. Christoph Koch is one of the biggest proponents of integrated information theory, IIT for short. According to this theory, consciousness can be measured in a single number, the big psi, which can be calculated from the connectivity of a system. I wouldn't exactly call him a crank either. Oh, and these two have eight co-authors who'd be insulted if I didn't mention them, so just imagine I read the entire list and you forgot about it. For what I'm concerned, IIT was killed years ago by Scott Aronson, who showed that there are ways to distribute the execution of simple algorithms on computer chips so that it'd have arbitrarily high consciousness. Then again, maybe my side just isn't high enough to understand what these geniuses are even talking about. The new paper now is supposedly an improvement over Penrose's idea that the collapse of the wave function causes consciousness and that this happens in the human brain every once in a while. You see, in quantum mechanics, particles can do this weird thing that they come into what we call a superposition, in which they do different things at the same time. Say they go both left and right. But we never observe this. When we observe a particle, it always does only one thing. It's either left or right. This is why we say that the state of the particle, which is described by a wave function, collapses when we look at it. It collapses into a normal, definite, non-quantum state. The trouble is, you can't observe the collapse itself, because whenever you observe a particle, it's already collapsed. It's kind of like my invisible friend who leaves the room each time you come in. The reason that Penrose thinks the collapse of the wave function creates consciousness is that he believes consciousness can't be computed. And since we know that everything besides the collapse of the wave function is computable in physics, the collapse must be it. Penrose also has this idea that the collapse of the wave function is caused by gravity, though that process is calculable, so make of this what you wish. The authors of the new paper now say, first of all, let's forget about gravity. Second, they discard the idea that consciousness is caused by collapse. Instead, they postulate that consciousness is created when a superposition forms. What happens with the superposition later? Nothing, because these people believe in the many worlds interpretation. Basically, their idea is that in the brain, you could get superpositions of possible experiences. Say, instead of a particle going left and right, your brain might try to produce an experience in which this sentence is both funny and not funny. But you never experience this. What you experience is a sentence that's either funny or not funny. So in the moment when the funny, not funny superposition could be created, your brain needs to select one. And in that moment, so their idea, consciousness is created. That might sound plausible if you phrase it in words, but mathematically I see a few problems. The biggest problem is that their idea of experience is ill-defined. The maths doesn't know that funny and not funny is not something you'll ever experience. Mathematically, funny and not funny is exactly as good or bad as funny or not funny or funny minus i times not funny and so on, even if that doesn't sound funny at all. They try to define experiences as those states of your brain which will eventually not decohere and say that you could use IIT to define it, but if they'd actually written down a definition and tried to calculate something with it, they'd have noticed that it doesn't work. How do I know that? Because no one's ever managed to do it. There's just a lot of physicists who think someone else has done it. It's actually quite funny. 
or maybe both funny and not funny. In any case, since they don't have a definition for what an experience is, they can't explain anything, I'm afraid. But wait, there's more. Next, they say that they want to test this idea by connecting a brain to a quantum computer because this should enable richer conscious experiences and make you a quantum cyborg. Yes, you know, I'm pretty sure that hooking your brain up to a quantum computer will be quite some experience. They then argue that this sort of expanded consciousness occurs during psychedelic, mystical, near-death and other types of extraordinary experiences. I'm sure lots of students will be sympathetic to the idea that quantum mechanics is a sort of near-death experience, but I'm not sure that this explains anything. Finally, they claim that this gives humans free will because maybe an organism can exercise some degree of choice in the libertarian sense over which classical configuration it is going to experience next. And what, I wonder, is it going to exercise that choice with? Is it free will that creates free will? This might leave you thinking this paper is pretty useless, but it does have a very interesting aspect. It's that the authors don't notice that their theory is super deterministic. You see, they split the experiences at the moment the superposition is formed. This is not the case in the many worlds theory. In that theory, the worlds only split when the measurement happens. If you instead split worlds when the superpositions form, you have for practical purposes invented a local collapse model. And now Bell's theorem comes to bite you because that tells you that such a theory needs to be super deterministic, that is, it has a hidden variable that's correlated with the measurement that you make. What's the hidden variable? Well, that's the experience which forms instead of the superposition. Why is it correlated with the measurement setting? Because once you've selected this one thing as an experience, you know that you'll not measure a superposition of it with something else. In summary, I think the idea is both interesting and not interesting. To me, science is more than a profession. It's a way to understand the world and to solve problems. This is why I'm happy to work together with Brilliant, whose mission is to help you learn science in the easiest and most engaging way possible. All courses on Brilliant have interactive visualizations and come with follow-up questions. I found it to be very effective to learn something new. It really gives you a feeling for what's going on and helps you build general problem-solving skills. They cover a large variety of topics in science, computer science and maths, from general scientific thinking to dedicated courses on differential equations or large language models. And they're adding new courses each month. It's a fast and easy way to learn, and you can do it whenever and wherever you have the time. Sounds good? I hope it does. You can try Brilliant yourself for free if you use my link brilliant.org Sabina. That way you'll get to try out everything Brilliant has to offer for full 30 days and you'll get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So go and give it a try. I'm sure you won't regret it. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.